In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about compressors, compression ratios, and the most important part of this is all troubleshooting. So just to review the compressor functions, it pumps refrigerant vapor. It's considered the heart of any refrigeration or air conditioning system. It increases refrigerant pressure. It raises the suction pressure to the discharge pressure, which means it's one of the point, one of the two points of pressure change. It increases the refrigerant temperature. It raises the suction temperature above ambient temperature. High temperature vapor can be cooled by the ambient air temperature. So vapor is condensed into a liquid metering device. So the reciprocating compressor operation is actually pretty simple. Okay, the two valves start off as closed, the piston in the up position. In the section B, which is the middle top, the piston starts coming down, the suction valve opens, and pulls in low pressure refrigerant from the suction line. C, we're at a point of equilibrium. Piston is all the way at the bottom of its stroke. And D, the piston starts to come up and it compresses the refrigerant against the valve on the high pressure side, pushing the valve open and allowing the high pressure vapor refrigerant to discharge into the discharge line. E, our piston is all the way at the top. And then F, the entire, okay, F, our piston begins its downward rotation and starts the whole cycle over again. The ratio of the discharge pressure to the suction pressure in PSIA, that's absolute pressure, difference from gauge pressure, is called the compression ratio. To calculate the ratio at design conditions, okay, we use a basic formula. So let's say an air conditioning compressor is rated at 40 degrees suction and 125 condensing. That's degrees. The ratio would be the absolute discharge pressure of R22 at 125 degrees, which comes to 278 plus the 14.7 or 293 PSIA, rounding off 14.7 to 15 pounds. Divide that by the absolute suction pressure of R22 at 40 degrees, so that's 69 plus the 14.7 or 84.7 PSIA. And again, we did some rounding here. So we take our 293 divided by 64, so we find a compression ratio of 3.5 to 1, or it could be written 3.5 colon 1. Okay, so again, this is the design condition. So we know from design what the ratio should be. Now, what we have to do is we have to de determine what it actually is. Okay, so at different space temperatures, different evaporator pre temperatures, and different head pressures, we're gonna have different compression ratios. So at a space temperature of 75 and 40, we have a 3.5 to 1. If we lower the evaporator temperature to 25 degrees, we're lowering the suction pressure. Okay, so now we have a 6.6 .6 to 1. You see how that two differences here changed the compression ratio. We lower it even further for a space temperature of negative 10, evaporator temperature of negative 20, so we go to a head pressure of 293 divided by our um, 10 and 15, which is 25. We come to an 11.8 to 1. Now we lower the thermostat even further or have a frosted evaporator. Our compression ratio goes to a 14.7 to 1. Freezers use a 25 degree temperature split to help keep compression ratios as low as possible. Higher compression ratios are more inefficient. Okay, So if I have a negative 10 degree freezer and a negative 20 degree evaporator, 
We have a 125 degree temperature split at 120 degrees condensing and a 95% ambient. The refrigerant is 404A. So under normal conditions, my compression ratio is 330 PSIA divided by 30 PSIA. That's 11 to 1. If I lower my suction pressure by only 10 PSIA, in other words, we have frost building up or we turn our box temperature down even more, then lower the temperatures, my compression ratio goes 16.5 to 1. This is a 50% increase in compression ratio. Okay, so if I increase my head pressure, okay, in other words, I might have a dirty condenser and I maintain my evaporator pressure, okay, all of a sudden my compression ratio also goes to a 16.5 to 1. It would take a 170 degree pressure in head increase in head pressure, but only a 10 psi drop in suction pressure. So I would have ex either an extremely dirty or hot outdoor environment, or I would have ice building up on the evaporator. So again, very little difference on the evaporator temperatures will cause a pressure drop and will cause suction pressure to drop. The effects of low suction pressures, easy. A low refrigerant content has less refrigeration effect less compressor cooling, more downstroke needed for re-expansion, and high compression ratios. High compression ratios equal high discharge pressures, burn discharge valve, and lubrication problems. So that's the effect of a low suction pressure. What causes low suction pressures? Running a system below design temperatures is one thing, lack of refrigerant, TEV adjustment, in other words, starving the evaporator, plugged filter dryer, excessive suction line pressure drop, in other words, restrictions in line, line might be too small, might be kinked, oil trapped and sags in the line set, causing restricted line, or suction line components problems, such as a suction dryer or EPR. Okay, lower than normal suction pressures will cause compressor issues. So what we're talking about here is it's a hermetic compressor. A hermetic compressor is an ancient Greek word for secret. It's an airtight container. The hermetic compressor is welded into a steel shell. It has internal springs balancing the motor and the suction gas cools the motor. This is an internal look at the hermetic compressor in a welded shell, okay? The shell, the motor has spring mounted, discharges gas, okay, pistons and valves are inside, crankshaft rotates, and the incoming suction gas comes down around the motor through pre-trilled holes and cools the motor. In latest models, a motor cover fits on top of the stator. All of the refrigerant vapor that is drawn into the cylinder will be drawn into the cover and directed across the motor from top to bottom. There are passageways in the body that will take the vapor from the bottom of the stator onto the low side of the head. This gives more uniform cooling of the motor. In some models, the opening in the cover is in line with the suction opening of the shell so that most of the cool vapor goes directly into the motor. This is referred to as directed suction and improves efficiency. Semi-hermetic compressors, the cast iron shell is bolted together, not welded. This allows you to do some service repairs on the job, for example, valve plates and oil changes. They can be rebuilt by the factory. So there's a lot of times there's a, what's called a core charge. So these have to be returned if you change them out and you get money back. Types of semi-hermetic compressors, you have suction cooled, the refrigerant cools the motor. You have air cooled, Air over the compressor body cools the motor. Water cooled means that water tubing that's included cools the body and cools the motor. So suction cooled compressors, the suction service valve on, is on the end of the compressor. Vapor passes over the motor cooling it. This is an example of a suction cooled compressor. Notice the vapor path coming in from the suction valve 
that goes completely through the motor before it goes to the um, valve body itself. Once all the refrigerant cooled compressors, the suction service valve is located on the motor compartment of the compressor. All other refrigerant cooled Copeland compressors have the suction service valve located on the stator cover. The refrigerant vapor and the entrained oil enters the compressor through the suction service valve. It passes through the suction screen as it enters the motor compartment. In the motor compartment, which acts as an expansion chamber, the refrigerant's vapor velocity is decreased. Due to the lower velocity, the oil separates and collects in the bottom of the motor compartment and returns to the crankcase through the oil check valve. The refrigerant vapor then goes through the motor air gap through the slots that are cast in the body around the motor compartment. The refrigerant vapor leaves the motor compartment through a passage cast in the compressor body. So semi-hermetic air-cooled and water-cooled tubing raft. The one on the left is a water-cooled. The one on the right is air-cooled. Notice the KW and the KA. Okay, the W as the second letter means it's water-cooled if you can't see the tubing. The, the one on the right has a KA, that means it's air-cooled. Air-cooled compressors can be identified by either its model numbers or by features of construction. The model number will have an A as the second digit when it's air-cooled. The compressor can be converted to a water-cooled on all except the L models by wrapping water tubing between the ribs of the motor end of the casting. <coughs> In this case, the second digit should be changed to a W. You can also identify the compressor by noticing that the suction service valve is on the side of the cylinders on an air-cooled type construction. Lubrication is important. There must be an oil film on every load-bearing surface. The crankcase must have enough oil. The level of oil in the site class must be visible. If it's too high, you can't see the top of the oil. If it's too low, you can't see any oil. Good oil level, as long as you can see in the sight glass, and Carlisle has specific levels based on the model of the compressor. Compressors equipped with an oil sight glass will allow regular inspection of the oil level during various system loadings. Oil level should be in the glass. This means under periods of low load, the oil level should not fall below the bottom of the glass. Under periods of higher loads, the level should not rise above the glass. When dealing with welded compressors that usually do not have sight glass, remember that excessive noise, vibration, and amperage are all indicators of the possibility of high oil level. So an oil sight glass, again, if you can't see the top of the oil, it's too high. If you can't see the top of the oil on the bottom, it's too low. If the top of the oil is in the middle of the glass, it's in the correct range. Common cause of compressor failures is liquid slugging, flood back, flooded start, and overheating. Liquid slugging just means that there's a slug of liquid on the piston head. This is normally refrigerant. Compressors cannot compress liquid. It breaks valves, pistons, rods, and crankshafts. If a large slug of liquid is drawn through the suction port, the mass and inertia of the liquid will drive the tip of the reed against the reed stop. The strain can eventually bend or break the top. This is an example of broken reeds from slugging. Okay, it cannot compress liquid. Flood back just means that liquid drop droplets are in the suction vapor. For air-cooled compressors, it washes the lubricant from the cylinder walls. For suction-cooled compressors, it washes the lubricant from the crankshaft. Okay, this is one of the pistons from that compressor. Even though it only ran for a few hours, had no slugging noises, the results are obvious. The washing of the liquid refrigerant removed the oil from the surfaces, allowing the metal to rub directly on metal. Okay, and liquid washed away the lubrication, and you can see here where it took a hunk of metal out of it. Suction cooled compressor crankshafts bearings that are worn by flooding. Again, flooding moves, removes oil 
because the liquid refrigerant will displace the oil. The diluted oil contains enough refrigerant to reduce the volume of oil available for bearing lubrication. As the refrigerant boils off in the drivetrain, the shortage of oil results in progressive wear pattern that gets worse as you move further from the oil pump. The most severe damage will be present at will be at the bearings closest to the motor. Sometimes motor burnout is caused by flooding. Flooding washes oil from the bearings. Bearing wear allows the rotor to hit the stator. Electrical burnout can result. As the motor end bearings wear significantly, the crankshaft will drop, causing the rotor to drag on the stator. This will result in a shortened or shorted or burned motor. If the compressor is not examined after it's failed, the, cost of the, the cause of the motor failure will remain unknown. You're looking for worn out bearings. Okay, this is an example. Okay, the rotor hit the stator, okay, eventually pulling the insulation off those wires and caused a short. No flooded damaged bearings. The damaged bearings allowed the rotor to drop. Here are some of the causes and cures for slugging and flooding. Low evaporator load. The cause is the space temperature might be too low. Airflow or dirty coil problems. The cures. Operate at design temperatures and make sure you have proper airflow and clean evaporators. Metering device problems can cause a flooded evaporator. Cure. Maintain proper superheat. So bottom line on this slide is you have to have clean equipment operating with the design specifications and your superheat has to be good 8 to 12 degrees during the off cycle refrigerant vapor migrates to the coldest spot vapor condenses to liquid in the crankcase liquid refrigerant sinks under the compressor oil during the startup the liquid under the oil explodes it expands fast within the crankcase it dilutes the oil on crankshaft bearing surfaces how do we prevent flooded starts? Two, two easy solutions. We use a crankcase heater or a pump down solenoid. You need to be careful of flooded starts in colder environments. Okay, if you're doing a cold ice chest and you have a cold outdoor environment, okay, in refrigeration, you want to use a pump down solenoid. If you have a heat pump that's in a cold environment, okay, you want to consider using a crankcase heater. We want to keep the liquid refrigerant out of the compressor. Compressor overheating causes lubrication breakdown, causes parts to seize, and it causes carbon deposits to form on valve plates and it clogs filter dryers. Maximum discharge line temperature for Copeland compressors are 225 degrees. For Carlisle compressors, 250 to 275, depending on the oil used. Line temperatures are always taken 6 inches from the compressor. You want to get the actual refrigerant temperature, not the temperature of the compressor body itself. High condensing temperatures are caused by low air flows, dirty condensers, overcharging, and non-condensables. The cures are easy. Check the fans and clean the condenser. Verify condenser split and subcooling. Non-condensables will show up on your gauges because you'll have a lot of fluttering in the gauges and your pressures will slowly and suddenly increase without explanation on the high side. High discharge temperatures are caused by lack of cool refrigerant, which is high superheat. Maintain proper superheat. Keep those suction pressures up within design temperatures. So again, we've gone through now, we've talked a little bit more about compressors. We've talked about compressor ratios and why temperatures are important. We've talked about several troubleshooting scenarios that are based on discharge temperatures, suction temperatures, and We've talked about what causes them. All of these are important as you consider continue your career in refrigeration with troubleshooting.